colleagues and guests this April 18th, 2022 regular meeting of the Mount Barbary School District Board of Education shall come to order. Roll call, Jeff. Here. Diana? Here. Owen? Here. Jim? Here. Leah? Here. Rod? Yes. And Jessica? Here. Dr. Solero has this meeting been properly noticed and certified. Yes. Thank you. Okay, well, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I will now read our district's mission statement. The Mount Barbary School District, in partnership with the community, is dedicated to nurturing, educating, and challenging all students, preparing and empowering them to be productive, responsible, and self fulfilled members of society. Item 1C, it is my duty and pleasure to administer the Board of Education oath of office to incumbent Leah Lipska. Leah Lipska, please join me in front. Where are we going? We do this different every time. Okay. Yes, yeah. Leah Lipska. Leah Lipska. Yeah. Mrs. Lipska, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Leah Lipska. I, Leah Lipska. Having been elected to the office. Having been elected to the office of Board of Education, of Board of Education of the Mount Barbary School District, of the Mount Barbary School District, and have not yet entered, but have not yet entered upon the duties thereof, upon the duties thereof, swear that I will support, swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin, and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin, and will faithfully and impartially, and will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of said office. Discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations on your Thank next you. Just so dedicated to her learning and 
So she's just one of the awesome, awesome examples of the great students we have in our school at the Intermediate Center. And she has just impressed me so much by how she's grown over these past three years. Here. And your little brother's here to cheer you on too. Do you think we can take a picture giving you this little certificate along with your teachers and Miss Howie, as well as uh, one of our board members who's the liaison to our intermediate center, Mr. Hanna. Tonight's a special night for Mr. Hanna too. So what do you say we try to take that picture just over in our picture studio? <laughs> Would that be okay? All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hanna. Thank you to the teachers for being here tonight. Board member. 
due to her extensive writing background. Though while I will admit that I still tend to double space after <laughs> a period, yeah. despite her counseling, I would be remiss if I didn't mention her services at WASB with the Policy and Resolution Committee. Thank you for your service there to support kids throughout the state of Wisconsin. I would also like to extend my thanks to your husband, Adam, daughters Josie and Chelsea, for loaning you to us for the past six years to help with the important work of the district. We know that there are times she came home late, times she was out of town for a conference, and times she may have been struggling internally with some important issues because of this work that took her away from you. We appreciate your sacrifice. Lastly, Kimberly, I would like to thank you for your service to this community during the past six years. Through building challenges to pandemic challenges, you were a strong and effective leader. We are a stronger district because of you. to American Family Fields in Milwaukee where the Brewers play. Um, they got to host a game there. They had a 5-1 to one victory against Portage, I believe. Portage, all right. Um, our golf team finished second place out of 16 teams last week at um, the Dodge Point Country Club. This Saturday, our uh, DECA members who qualified for the International Conference uh, will be traveling to Atlanta. Uh, very excited to do that for five days. Um, this Friday, our drama club is hosting their spring play. Um, tickets are $3 for students and $5 for adults. Um, our forensics team recently traveled to their state competition where they brought home a, where they brought back a gold and two or three silver medals. Um, next Saturday, we'll we will be having students travel to UW Platteville to participate in the State Solo and Ensemble Festival. And then going back a couple weeks, um, our high school band held their annual Viking Band Show. Um, it was two sold out days of just music. It was absolutely incredible. 
um, to have that back after a couple of years of not being able to do that. Um, yeah, that's about it. I guess I'll just end by giving personal thanks to Ms. Saylor and Mr. Hanna for your time on the board. Um, both of you have served as role models to the students here um, and have definitely left a lasting impact on the district because of your hard work and dedication. So thank you. Very kind, Owen. Thank you. Dr. Salerno, any more news? As usual, Owen does a terrific job. That's all we have. Board members, other news to share. I'm sure that Mrs. Lipska wants to say something about the PTO's latest venture. Um, well, it's not until the 20th, but we are throwing a mini prom. Um, so more information will come on that. And we're doing brats on the lot actually uh, this weekend, the 23rd. Um, at the Miller's. On the lot? At Miller's. Great. It's for brats sale weekend. Um, 10 to 1, I believe. 10 to 1. Great. We'll make sure to stop by it. Board members, any other news to share? All right, we'll transition to item 3E, citizens' comments. 3E already, wow, okay. Has yeah. anyone signed up? One person you may have heard of before uh, signed up, a gentleman by the name of Adam Sigler. No, oh, I think I know the name. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the risk of being a little bit content, since we've heard so many things already, I did just want to take a few minutes to also recognize both our outgoing board members, so this is both for Jeff, you and Kimberly. I save the personal stuff for later, so this is <laughs> for both of you. Um, I've had a front row seat to this for the last six six years um, to watch you two along with the rest of the board um, and see you know how you do a lot of hard work to ensure that my heart's students are getting the education they deserve, and you should be proud of that your courage to stand up for the kids, plus the faculty and the staff in a public space where not everybody always agrees, and it's not always a friendly audience sometimes either, um, is very inspiring. Um, I feel nervous just talking to say something nice in 30 seconds right now. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm very uh, impressed by the work that you do every week um, over the last six years and the last 20 years. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing your time and talents here. Uh, you're, you've made incredible impacts on the district, and I'm proud of everybody. Thanks. <sighs> Alright, I'm going to need a bucket, so just a little we'll, we'll let to know other <laughs> citizens' comments. I didn't see any of them. Thank you, Mr. Saylor. The district will follow up with your concerns. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, the second citizen's comment portion is offered at the end of this meeting, which you may register for at any time during this meeting. Moving on to items 4A, personnel transactions. Dr. Solano, any remarks here? Just two quick items, board members. This includes our co-curricular list of appointments for next year, as well as there's an addendum. Motion to approve. Second. Motion made by Jeff, seconded by Leah to approve the personal transactions and the addendum. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries and personal transactions are approved. Item 5, our consent agenda. Would any board members like to call letters A through F to remark individually? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Motion made by Rod and seconded by Jessica to approve the consent agenda. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion passes. Moving on to tonight's discussion items. Item 6A, committee member reports. Mr. Hanna, you're not done yet. How about your report for BGT? Okay, we met on March 23rd, I think it was. And uh, Dave started us off with his report for the building and grounds update and reported that in one of the evening custodians started at the high school that Monday and they were still looking for a few more custodians to help out with the team and the department continues to have interviews for that time and for those people. Uh, They were working on the equipment for the spring, mowing and getting the fields ready. Um, 
team recently met with representatives of the softball boosters, the village works department, and the school district and the village board to discuss a couple of topics and they were softball lights for the varsity field which is a roughly projected cost of 150000 and there was also some talk about uh, uh, tennis courts in there and that the tennis courts they will be a further updated thing as we go further ahead because the village doesn't really know what they want to do yet there. And uh, you know, whenever they decide we got half the bill, so and that'll be lights and everything. Um, the transportation Scott Young reported that our new two new buses potential delivery date is November if everything is there for them to make it and get them done. Otherwise it's whenever. Um, Brian was too busy to participate in the meeting. We had lots of field trips going out. The buildings and athletics departments were keeping up and trying to keep up with the sports schedules and we still have a severe bus shortage because we had a couple more that have decided to leave and uh, we discussed the budget and the budgets were for the building and grounds there was a projected $25,000 increase in the utility cost and the budget remains mostly unchanged. Then the Scott presented a copy of the proposed transportation budget and uh, proposed increases in the budget included fuel, additional for the buses and that uh, the budget for the transportation was increased by $168,000 because they're putting one bus into this year's budget and this is the coming year is the year that you have to purchase three in the rotation. Um, Then the next thing was the discussion on private transportation contracts. There was that was just briefly reviewed, and that it would be more discussion on it in the upcoming two meetings because by July they'll have to know something about it. Whatever. It is decided by the board and uh, capital maintenance plan. They presented a one to four year uh, building and grounds budget of 130,000 and that 130,000 covers most of the minor things that the district can cover and a lot of the major stuff is pushed into referenda and the 5 to 9 and 10 to 14 year terms of the potential projections were uh, discussed and will be brought up later on and a long-range plan in 
discussions later down the road. And then we adjourned at 6.25 that evening. That is the end of my report. Super, questions for Jeff? Thank you, Jeff. We'll move on to finance with Mrs. Sarah Cody. Finance committee met last Monday on April 11th. Um, we had no donations to consider. The bulk of my report is just a teaser for what Scott will present shortly. Um, we discussed the purchase of additional Chromebooks. We discussed the purchase of a new Thomas bus. Um, we discussed the um, uh, topic that we had talked about at the workshop, we talked about again about liaison positions within community um, groups and Dr. Slur and I was going to have that policy reviewed by WASB to see if they had any suggestions for language. Um, we reviewed three new board policies regarding the management of federal funds that are going to be shown again later and one revision to our um, public gifts to school policy which will also be Lots of policy talk that will be here shortly. Great. Questions for Jessica? Okay, time for Mrs. Lipska for safety and wellness. So, it wasn't our last meeting because we met before this, but I'm going to go with the previous meeting. We met March 21st. Um, as part of our mental health update, um, Brian gave us an update on the non-violent non crisis intervention training. Um, that was held in the March and April or early releases. Um, and then come July 19th and 20th, we are collaborating with NAMI to bring in crisis intervention um, partner training. Uh, we talked about for school, our school safety update, the bullying form, and making it something that can be fill outable. Because um, right now you have to print it. I don't know about all of you, but I don't have a printer. I think most people don't anymore. So making that so they can fill it out online and send it in. Um, we also talked about the tabletop drills that were done at the district office where they were going to be done they have now been done uh, as part of our equity update we talked about the equity and wellness day at the high school and um, got some updates from our students that they what they like to see what they didn't like to see um, and we talked about the equity framework which we will talk about in a little while here Oh, we had a very nice presentation from our school social workers um, with a very nice um, cheat sheet on what a school social worker does because I don't know, you're like me, but I can do social worker, guidance counselor, school counselor. We have all sorts of names out there. So it was a nice little handout that said what they did. And I think we were going to put that on our website. Um, and our next meeting was tonight, but I'm not going to tell you about that. Or I'll have nothing to talk about it. So <laughs> that is the end of my report. Good foresight. Questions for Leah. Thank you, Leah. And on to Mrs. Rothenberg for education, please. I do not have a report tonight. I was unable to attend them before. Wonderful. Uh, let's see. Mrs. Stock, anything that you'd like to highlight? Or otherwise, we'll see you in policy later at the meeting. Correct. Yes. The majority of our work focused on the four changes with the course proposal. So, yes. Great. We will review that shortly then. Item 6B, our first information advocacy report for our triple hit tonight for SENDA Senior Leading College Board Recommendations for Course of Study, Mrs. Strachan. Thank you, board members. We received uh, this report in your packet, so I'm only going to go over maybe three main highlights from it tonight. Um, some new pieces that I've added or some new ahas maybe that we haven't seen before. So the first piece, yeah, first piece, thanks, Dr. Slamas, figure one. Um, overall, the number of high school graduates has fluctuated over the past 20 years, but we are seeing over the past about decade to, yeah, a little over a decade, the number of, of graduates in general decreasing, and actually, when we look at specifically by race, and in, in this instance, it's just looking up the, the percentage of the amount of white students, um, we do see a decline in the number of white graduates. Then I want to dig a little deeper into that. Think, well, what about Dane County? 
and if you're looking at Dane County, um, I, I wasn't able in, in this figure to show the projection of white students, but it's relatively flat and it's much higher up on this chart. But we do look at um, the students, uh, the, the types of graduates by race and ethnicity, we do see an increase um, in the number of students, particularly those students who <coughs> identify as two or more students or those students who identify as Hispanic or Latino. And that um, brings us to implication, it, that, that brings us to implications of our work in Alcora and really seeing how just in Dade County alone, we start to see more students who are graduating of color, more students in our schools of color within Dade County. That then reflects in our work and what we're doing here as well. So I thought that was interesting and I pulled that information, um, which is public as well from Wisconsin Body Population Laboratory. They do a lot of this work looking at our current schools and statistics. So that was interesting to see. I put the links at the bottom of the report in footnotes. You can dig deeper if you like. The next piece, uh, looking at table one. We also pulled the University of Wisconsin system for court and remediation education for math and for reading. Um, within table one, we can see that we have had less students. Um, this past, or actually two years ago, fall of 2020, entered the UW system, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, further down in the report. Um, but we, this was the first year where we um, did not have six or more students who were in need of math, math remediation. Granted, we only had 39 students reported in fall of 2020 to go to UW school. But in doing the math, uh, we have seen a decline in the percentage of students needing math remediation in that last column, which is neat to see. It's slowly been declining over the year. And with this report, we also, um, as we have had in past years, had six or fewer students identified for reading. So that's remained the same as well. I'm not going to be touching on the Madison College post-secondary piece. I, I just added um, the 2021 data, so you can take a look at that if you haven't yet as well. But I wanted to touch on for my third third piece to highlight, looking at the percentage of students uh, who entered college or, and or persisted beyond. In figure one, so this is where we can start to look at how the pandemic has affected students who entered post-secondary after immediately after high school. Uh, last year in this report, we saw uh, the 2020 data and we did see that that purple line is the overall percentage of students. And we did you see that drop in 2020, 60% of students entering college and after high school. But now we have the 2021 data. And we see that class of 2021 um, students did choose to go back. Granted, we're not at that percentage where we were at previous years, but we do see a rebound the students did choose to re-enter the uh, university system after maybe taking a year off. And when we look at persistence as well, and in figure two then, uh, so persistence is the uh, percentage of freshmen who <coughs> decide to continue on into their sophomore year. And we do see which that purple line again is all institutions relatively flat. Um, we do see an increase of students in that yellow, I'm sorry, the orange line of those students who did uh, decide to persist, continue to a two-year university or two-year college versus the green line, which is the four years. That's interesting as well, how students have continued to move on in an institution um, and how that maybe the institution supported them or looking at maybe the learning pathways or models within that institution as well that they decided to go back. So just some different pieces, some different ahas than that. Questions for Sarah? Sarah, may I ask you a question? Can we scroll back to the one that the previous one about students entering college? Yeah. Sarah, the number between 2020 and 2021, those are new graduates. The 2021 number doesn't necessarily include students who graduated in 2020. The class of 2020, so the class of 2020, class of 2021. Right. Yeah. So like those students that graduated 2020, we didn't go to school. We don't know if they decided to go a year later. Okay, that's what I. That's what I was. That's what I thought. But I just yeah, because sure. yeah. yeah. we don't track those kids after that part. Yeah, yeah. The immediately pieces there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Other questions for Sarah? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah. All right, Mr. DeYoung and Mr. Reed have our next.
next report. Progress on our district's long range facilities plan. Thank you. Hello everyone. Welcome. Um, this, as you may recall, is part of our board strategic plan. Um, the second board meeting of every April. Um, we come to you with an updated uh, long-range facility analysis as well as sort of a long-term projection of where some of our capital needs are looking. Um, the Building and Grounds Committee, Building and Grounds and Transportation Committee, typically in the months of February and March review these documents in preparation for um, tonight's presentation to the board. So for those of you that have been on the board for a few years, you've seen this document in the past. Um, we call it our letter grade document, and simply it's a way for us to simplify building envelope items and assigning a letter grade just like you would in the classroom. And so um, it starts at the top of the ELC and goes all the way down to the bottom where we talk about um, things like funding. So with that, um, I'll let Dave talk a little bit about some of the, the important items in each building, specifically where we saw letter grade changes for the better or for the worse. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, this is, um, this is a document that we created back in 19 um, to basically give you a, a snapshot of where we felt certain aspects of, of each facility was at. Um, uh, just like a child, there's you know, some very strong in reading, maybe that's a good in math, if we have some buildings that are stronger in some areas and weaker in others. Um, this data comes from um, my staff, my building staff. Um, uh, some, sometimes we get in professionals to kind of give us their two cents worth of where they think things are at. Um, longevity, we went to a standard document that said, you know, roof is usually good for 30, 35 years. So, so up to that number is, um, uh, from, from standard uh, uh, information. Uh, there's a bit of crystal balling that goes on in there too. You know, um, I talk with my staff and we figure out how, where am I having problems at. Um, but you know, we, I, I come to a, a point where I, I sign things a letter grade so that we can discuss where our needs are at. Um, as Scott said, we'll start with the ELC. Um, again, I'm giving the roof a F based on its age alone. Um, we are, we see a leak or two here and there. Um, still not as, you know, not as bad as I would have hoped. I, I thought it would be. I <laughs> thought it would be better than I hoped it would be. Um, you know, quite frankly, 20 years beyond its, uh, its uh, lifespan. Um, the envelope itself, um, that letter grade went down a, a bit. I just noticed some of the uh, exterior uh, siding and stuff probably could use some, some touch up. Again, when we have to decide what we're going to do with that building. Um, the other thing that went down was the uh, HVAC system. It just continues to degrade. It's, it's 1967-68 original, uh, save for the boilers. Uh, you know, the rest of the hardware, the rest of the, the infrastructure is just uh, getting very, very long in the tooth. And all the changes in the ELC. At the PC, um, the only change that I recognized over the last year was the uh, envelope itself. The uh, 19... 1918 original brick building uh, is going to need some attention. The brick itself is 100 years old for crying out loud. Uh, they did some repairs when it was renovated in 2012, but there's some other things that we probably should look at. Uh, nothing to, to um, worry imminently about, but we're going to have to uh, keep that in, our, in the back of our heads. We're going to need to do some work there. Moving along to the IC. Um, we downgraded the, uh, the roof. Um, or we had the roof replaced, um, part of the roof replaced during the 2020 referendum. Um, so all the flat areas were replaced with a new rubber membrane. Those guys get a, those are, those are in great shape. Uh, at that time, we, the, we, we chose not to address some of the other uh, areas. And I just want to keep that on our radar. It's, it, those things are average at best. So between the two, I'm giving the B minus. Um, other things in there. Oh yes. Um, we're at OHPAC. Yeah, I downgraded that from a B to a D uh, solely on the um, the controls. 
Uh, if you don't know that we have automation systems in the buildings that turn the heat up, turn the heat down, you know, they help us be as efficient as possible. The, uh, the current system is, um, well, it's obsolete. All right. Um, it's going to need to be replaced with a newer uh, system. Um, right now, one of, the, one of the fears that we have is that uh, you know, something could go wrong. It requires a computer with Windows 97 to talk to it. So we uh, we worry a bit about that. We think we've got you know fallback in, 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 in case we have issues, but I want to change that there to make sure that we knew that we were going to need to address that shortly. Same situation with the fire uh, in under electrical, the fire alarm system. Uh, the panel that's in there from 2001 when it was built is now not supported by um, Simplex Grinnell, so that will need to be upgraded. That's not a big ticket item, that just needs to be done. Moving on to the middle school, I don't believe I had any changes in that. We put a lot of, of effort into that uh, in, the, uh, in the 19 or 20 referendums. Everything seems to be in, in pretty decent shape there. Don't see that. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right, where are we at here? We're back to the high school. Um, I think I had a change in the envelope. I was noticing uh, walking around the building that some of the expansion joints are, um, are requiring some, some tuck pointing that may need to be done. Again, just uh, you know, it's just getting, it's 1997, so it's going to need to have some, some love done to it. Let's see, where are we going here now? Um, I don't think there's anything else in that group that is changed. No. Bus garage, um, no real change there. District office, uh, the district office, okay. <laughs> where, do we, where do we go with the district office? Not much change there. Um, I did, uh, on the plus side, we did get a new HVAC system in there last fall. So they've got a new uh, furnace and, and air conditioning. Um, we got it uh, fixed right before it fell apart, I think. So uh, that's an upgrade for that one. Um, we did upgrade a little bit to the parking lot. Um, made some patches, uh, seal coated it, restriped it, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not spending a lot of money at the district office. You know, as, as we all know, we're trying to figure out where, where, where we go with a couple of our buildings. So like at the ELC and the district office, we only do what we really have to. to on. You know what I mean? uh, sports complex, the track, track are trying to get repairs scheduled for the spring. The, the, the long winter or, or late spring has um, pushed off the, the company that uh, will uh, will come and make the repairs for the track. I, I I've been trying to get in contact with them an awful lot lately. And I'm not getting any, any feedback, any, any, anything concrete. So uh, those will have to maybe get pushed off to the summer. Other than that, the rest of the sports uh, complex, concession stands, everything, they, um, they haven't changed anything. So that's a lot to take in. Is there any questions about that? I yes. have one question. So if notes on the high school boilers, that 2023-2024 replacement, for the ones that are not new. Correct. Is that still the goal? There again, we're, you know, they, they, I think what was the... Um, See that, you know, some of that stuff is, is, is good for 30 years. We're getting to the end of that lifespan. Now, I will also say that I don't have trouble with those boilers. I'm just projecting out that, you know, at some point here, we're going to have to address those. There's 10 boilers that heat the high school. Four of them are brand new with the latest referendum. Six are 1997 era boilers. Three over the stage, three down by the uh, library. And um, again, not having trouble with them. We do PM on that, you know, regularly. So I don't, I don't see it. But at some point, we're going to have to address that. I don't know that 2023, 2024 is is the time frame, but it could be. And how much is a boiler? I mean, is that something that you cover in your budget, or is that something that no, not there's not no chance. Cover? But yeah, that's that's the thing. I, as Jeff reported, I have about hundred thirty thousand dollars a year to do. Uh, some of the maintenance throughout the district that includes requests for new sidewalks or doorways or you know whatever. I try to work with the principals and, and, and pick a little my budget, a little their budget to get some of their needs accomplished. Um, I can refer to like the um, the 
upgrade to the control system at the IC, $200,000. Yeah, I'm not going to have it. The upgrade to the uh, the firearm system, $7,000. Yeah, I can, I can do that. So, yeah, boilers aren't going to fit into my budget whatsoever. Great. Now, if I did one at a time, maybe, but, yeah. I, I, I'm guessing I'm guessing that if, if we go down that road we're placing boilers, we'll maybe cut from three to two in each in each end. Uh, and I'd have to have a, a contractor um, design that out for us. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. And then my other um, question is just like a future note for this document. It might be it would be helpful for me anyway if um, we would list the current enrollment and current capacity of each building just so that we can understand when we're getting close to busting out at the seams as far as kids. Right, I, 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 I have purposely not included that on this document. I, 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 my, for me, my lane will be specifically the condition of the building. Sure. How, 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 it, um, how it works for teaching, for education, I think that's more of a principal thing. We can certainly put that down. I'm just, just looking for like a broad number of just the capacity because as you're looking at a building that maybe um, you know things are in the B's or the C's and if you're also looking at the fact that it's over capacity then that's a discussion then okay yeah we could we could certainly put that down there maybe I can consult with the uh, we're supposed to time. get some get their, get, their, get their impression of how how tight it is because right. again, like I said, I, I can walk around the building like the middle school and, and, and say, yep, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but I don't know where capacity is and how, how it functions. That's a more of a Paul question. But we'll do that. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dave, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Thanks for all your hard work with this. It's a, it's a great, a lot of information. But am I correct with the PC having some plumbing issues? Down by the gym, specifically. Yeah, there are some there are some plumbing issues that um, I don't know that it it, it clogs. All right, it's not that it's, it's failing. I think it was a poor design. That's easy for me to say. You know, a few years and a couple of um, call, calls to room or whatever later, I think why we should have done this different. Uh, I do need to make some repairs. If you are correct, I think I can you know, handle those in my. Okay, that was you know, but it's not failing, right? It's it's. Only ten years old. No. Just, just, I look at that sometimes and scratch my head. Don't really think about that. Okay. Yeah. So it's a budget issue. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Other questions on this document? All right. Well, on a related note, these gentlemen will lead us through item sixty: annual capital improvement and maintenance report. So one of the things, as Jeff brought up, I think Dave brought up. Um, Dave does not only look at from a, a budget point of view um, where he's at with utilities and all the other things that, you know, snow removal um, and so on, but in addition, he has a project budget, um, we stay pretty consistent at $130,000. Um, certainly with any budgets, building budgets, Dave's budget, et cetera, with inflation, obviously, they become more and more challenging when the bottom line remains the same. Nevertheless, the purpose of the document that's up on the board is to project out for four years um, where buildings and grounds thinks it could utilize its $130,000 annual project budget. Once we get beyond four years, it becomes more of a snapshot, big picture kinds of things. It's pretty difficult, I think, Dave, and I maybe you would agree, to even project out four years what might be the most important thing on hand at that particular year to address. But this is the best work that the department's been able to put together. And, excuse me, it's been nice because since we've been doing this a few years now, we're able to really plan ahead for where we can best utilize these project dollars. That's the financing person talking about. How about they talk about their day-to-day -day real stuff. Right, so um, some, some of the some of the items on here, you will have done uh, fire panel repairs at the primary center, um, controls upgrade at the IC. Those, those are all things that, you know, I've talked about. Um, and then there's other things like um, a storage building, you know. Um, I'll have 
principals come to me and say, boy, I'd really like to have a plaza out back in the middle school for Gaga Hall. Like, okay, where's that gonna, where's that gonna come from? Because I didn't look up where Gaga Hall was. Uh, but at any rate, so I, I've, got, I've got kind of this list of wants and needs and stuff. I'd like to do stuff. The principals have asked me, hey, can you do this? Can we, can we, can we possibly do this to help them out? And I kind of spread those out into in these next four years, and these things are all very, very fluid. Um, so much today really depends on how long, they, how long it takes for me to get stuff, right? I can, I can order, I can order some electronic part today and not see it till December, right? So, and if I have to get, if I have to pay for it this fiscal year, as opposed to next, I have to. I, there's going to be a lot of shifting of when things get done. I have to take, I have to take contractors and. And things when they're available. So, um, but this is my best projection over the next four years where the need is going to be, or where where I should put my money uh, in, in place. And as Scott said, I've got another plan that's the years five through nine, and another one that's that's the, the next uh, five years. That is totally crystal ball. I, I, I'm thinking that out there, I'm going to need to put boilers in, or I'm going to need to do. Uh, crack and, and, and seal coat and driveways and, and things like that. So again, and what's really important about that is if you look at how much per year I'm projecting, $130,000 is not going to cut it. I'm not going to be able to keep up with those things in the long haul. And as Scott alluded to, the price of things is ridiculous right now. So. Again, this is my best guess. This is this is this is my best uh, opinion of where we're going to be as we go down the road. And things can change rather quickly, right? There's, there's all sorts of other things that could pop up that we didn't have we didn't have on our radar. Questions? Excellent snapshots to help us form a future for us to determine what needs to be done. And thank you, BGT Committee. Right, absolutely. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Right. Item 6B with Mr. Johnson and you all for equity focus decision making referred by SAW. Mr. Brian makes his way to the floor. It might be helpful to remind the board that this was a topic that the board had requested of the superintendent for development. Uh, but how do we move forward in meeting the needs of our students in our school district? And thank you, Brian, and your committee for yeah. putting this together. So we had a committee. Um, I'll give them a little recognition. But we had um, Talisa <coughs> um, Corcoran, Emily McGonigal, um, Paul Christensen. Uh, and all participate and kind of help with this as long as others who were kind of consulted along the way. How we really saw this work a lot was really with our administrative team and focusing on when we're developing policies, are we equitable and how we're making decisions and on the language that we're using, as well as team decisions um, as school teams are looking together uh, when they're deciding on field trips. Is it equitable? Can all kids participate in a field trip? So just kind of in those kind of categories. So we've spent a majority of the school year so far working on getting it down to six questions. Um, the first one, who's most impacted by the decision being made and are they included or excluded? Um, and so the, the language that we ended up using under here was uh, all part of our equal educational opportunity policy. Um, so it's all consistent throughout. Our second question is what are the positive outcomes? What are potential unintended consequences? And if there are those, how do we mitigate them? Does the district align with the district equity statement, strategic plan, and does it does data and resource the research support it? Um, does it include does the decision include wording that's inclusive of all represented groups? Um, how does this ensure the same academic rigorous standards for all academics, um, for all students? And is it sustained? And so we put it under a discussion item because this is a fluid document. It can be changed, um, can kind of be updated as we go. Um, but this is our general thinking of, of how we can kind of continuously think about these um, questions as we continue to make decisions um, across our district. And, and the, the example that I used in our committee and saw too that, you know, just 
comes up a lot, it came up a lot for me as a teacher. Um, it's like little decisions that you don't think about, and so to kind of have this in your forefront, but um, when we're making decisions on field trips, right? Um, can a student with a wheelchair be able to participate in that field trip? And, and if a student can't participate because they're in a wheelchair, should we really be going on that field trip? Um, so that all kids can participate, right? And the decisions that we're making as a school is a learning opportunity. So. A lot of work in one document. Questions for Brian? So what's the, the status of this um, decision-making model? Is it implemented or what, I mean, what, what, what's, what are the next, what are the next steps? We'd see it be back on the board, and then we would roll it out with our administrative team, and um, and then share with staff. Could you, uh, Dr. Solano, could you scroll up? or whether it's a field trip. 
how do we how do we stop that from something um, unintended happening? Our goal is all, right? And we know that just basic every decision that we make is not going to meet with everyone's needs, right? But all means all. Each and every single child entrusted to our care. And so that word mitigation is really a great word because we are wanting to mitigate any kind of adverse impact on students. And when there's a perception that that's the case, we want to know about it so that it can be vetted. And then in turn, uh, we can provide a response or provide some kind of remedy to the person who feels as though they've been uh, discriminated against for lack of a better word. something that is not new to the district, something that you've been 
you've been doing already, and this is merely a, a, a checklist, then what, what's been your experience with your ability to actually get that done? Right, so, and again, I, I go back up to the, and again, I'm not, the, the, there's nothing wrong with the list, but it is a, it's a, it, it's a relatively expansive list. And so how good have we gotten, or not, at, at including wording that um, is inclusive of, 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 of anyone that could be represented on that, on the list in number one? I think we're getting there. Um, so I just think of the policies too, and, and sometimes it takes a few people, but I think to review, you know, kind of go through it, review it, and, and saw it definitely picks up on some of the things that might have got missed. But I think that's the, you know, there was a lot of our policies that he, she, and so just taking out the student, right? I mean, we just change it to student. Um, also, like, you know, the other example, the, the most commonly is, is parent. Um, and then guardian, right? It's inclusive of all groups. So parental status, gender identity, all of those things are in it. Right. Anything else for Brian? Please thank your team that went into contributing to this. Thank document. you. Thanks. Um, all right, we will transition to our action items this evening. Item 7A, School Perceptions, is with us again as they work to finalize our referendum survey. Just so I know, do you want to update us on any changes since our last meeting? Well, good evening, Dr. Ron. Hi. It's a pleasure to meet you. I have you here today. Sure. Do you mind come joining us? Can I sit so I can type off? Of course. Okay. Yes. And Dr. Ron has just been a wonderful resource in helping our team develop what we hope to be succinct language that will hopefully be approved here yet tonight with the long-term vision of getting out a survey to all community members not just those who have children within our schools, um, sometime within the next two to three weeks with the ultimate goal of receiving the results of this survey towards um, the mid to latter part of June um, that we would present publicly as we've done in the past. And so uh, Rob has a wonderful gift, uh, the ability to take a lot of ideas and, and bring them uh, to uh, uh, I think an understanding uh, for everyone, but we wanted to make certain now that you've had the chance to review this document, if there are additional ideas or questions or thoughts that you have, that now would be the time to do that, please, and thank you. The floor is open for your feedback. Dr. Rob, did you want to say a few things just to get um, off the ground? Uh, well, let's start with questions, and I was, I was fussing with the, the part of the document that has the track changes in here. Um, is that something that I can email you and still have included, or does it actually need to be a part of your packet? Uh, it can be sent to me, because this okay. is okay. Yes. Okay. Let me do that then. Is that... But the rest of it is the same. It's just the page that has some track changes on that I was about uh, By the way, this this one that I have the track changes, it would be the uh, operational funding page with the question on it. As he's pulling that up, any questions about the other pages that are in here? Uh, so the one that I'm looking at that will be pulled up is page three. So one, two, or four, three, if you have any questions or feedback, I'd be happy to talk about that. So essentially what, what I'm trying to do here is talk a little bit about how you've gotten to where you've gotten. And it's a bit of a continuation from the previous page. Uh, so the previous page talks a little bit about um, whether referendums are common. We define the operational and capital referendum. Talk a little bit about how your funding has changed. And then contextualize your mill rate as compared to some of your, your neighboring districts. Um, so with that being said, this page then uh, notes that you, you do always continue to reduce expenses, um, but your financial projections forecast a budget shortfall. Um, so what you would be doing is asking the community consider, to consider a recurring operational referendum that would eventually provide an additional $10.3 million per year. Um, and you would use these dollars for the following purposes. 
Um, so these would be things like maintaining student programs and services, uh, paying for the increasing cost of transportation, utilities, and technology, um, attracting and retaining high quality staff by paying salaries that are competitive with your neighboring districts, and funding student services. Um, so the, those counselors, school psychologists, and social workers that I heard you mention before. Um, so I want to give some indication about what, this do what these dollars will be used for, but also in a way that is, is friendly enough where if I don't know anything about schools, I would still know what it is that you're trying to do with, with my tax dollars. Um, then laying out, uh, because this is kind of a, a step model, so you're not coming out right out the door with 10.3 million, um, you're going to build up. So I thought, well, the easiest, uh, easiest way for me to see this as a survey taker is thinking, okay, what year and how much money are we collectively as taxpayers providing you to the district? So in year one of this being in place, it would be 4.5 million um, spreading out over the next few years then up until you get to uh, 10.3 million. Um, and then the most important question of all, great, what does that cost me? Uh, so we note down here at the bottom that if voters approve this potential operational referendum, taxes are projected to increase by about 87 for every $1,000 of property value, which is what the bill rate is, um, or 187 for every $100,000 of property value. Uh, and then we ask the question, based on this information above, above, would you support a recurring operational referendum? Um, and I do know there were a couple of other notes in here before about what factors affect a mill rate, and I actually did that then on the previous page when I defined what a mill rate is, and then noted that it's affected by things like property values, the amount of aid you get from the state, your student enrollment, and so on. So I don't, I don't think it's accurate to call it a recurring operational referendum. It is only recurring if the voters of the community uh, uh, approve a second one. So I, I would just call, I would just say consider a operational referendum. I would just strike recurring wherever we we see it. It is not recurring. So um, it will, it will, sorry, it will be on a as recurring because it's not sunsetting. If it was going to expire after 2627, then it would be. Then, okay, then we've, then we've we've misapplied the adjective to referendum. It is not a recurring referendum. It's a recurring, uh, it's, it's a recurring um, increase in the revenue limit, but it is not a recurring referendum, right? I mean, the, the voters will not vote on this more than once. If, if, if that, that's what it would be if the voters voted on it more than once, then it would be a recurring referendum. What, what we're, oh boy, oh boy. So here what I would say to consider an operational referendum on a recurring basis. No, they're not considering a referendum on a recurring basis. But it's considered a recurring referendum because it was... No, a referendum is what voters vote on. And voters will not vote on this more than once. Right, but it's considered reoccurring because it's going to continue to happen. Right. We're not going to vote on a recurring... Listen, we got to be honest with these folks. And this is not a recurring re referendum. It is a single referendum and for whatever period... if. If, if it's if it's not for if we can't say it's for a period of time and it is it is a a single referendum in perpetuity as far as we know right now right I mean we don't have any plans to I, I discern, don't include me in that we but we don't have any plans to uh, uh, to, to bring that bring another referendum uh, back to the community right that's a recurring referendum and and we're, we're we're mis we're misapplying we're mis we're misthinking about what what is actually happening. The referendum is not recurring. The levy, the increase in the levy, is right. Mm -hmm. That and we, and, then, and and I think I actually this is why we got to be careful about this because if, I'm, a, if, I'm I was going to say if I were a taxpayer, which of course I am, I would think very differently about a recurring referendum and a recurring increase in the revenue limit. Those are two very, very different things. They're not even close. Um, the other way that, that so two, two things. So one, I want to start kind of putting the big toe in the water for how a ballot question will be. The other way it's voted, the, the other way it appears on a ballot question is an operational referendum for recurring purposes. Now, if you want to, what I can't tell you is if you want to say this is forever and never. Right. Yeah, we haven't had that discussion yet. That's, that'll be a fun one. But the way it's right now is not accurate. So the, the way I changed 
received it in the document that would be there for the district is asking the community to consider an operational referendum for recurring purposes. That is word for word. Based on most of the referendum, recurring referendums I've seen, I have some of the ones from April pulled up, it's referred to that alter alternatively as for recurring purposes. Instead of non-recurring purposes, which then would have a two or one, two, five, if you're receiving 29 year period of time. Yeah, and then, so this brings me to my second point. <laughs> that, that, that table is misleading. Because if I'm, if I'm looking at this survey, and this is the first piece of information that I get about what that referendum looks like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think that that referendum recurs, if, depending upon how you characterize the referendum, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna characterize it, right? Until 2027, right? So that's it's got to be footnoted. It's got we've got to that that's not that's not actually an accurate portrayal of what's going on. If you want to have a referendum in perpetuity, then that table is misleading as well. Because that table to me says we're done in 2027. I say great, only four years. That's awesome. So would you like the words like I'm going? What, what, what we I don't you, you've got is it, 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 whatever whatever you think but that's that's misleading. Ongoing is probably the word that's most friendly that I would use. An ongoing ten point three million. Yeah, no, I'm not. Yeah, we we can talk about that, but I'm talking about the table with right. the years. I would add another row and put an ongoing. And oh, I see. I'm sorry. Yes, ongoing ten point three. Yeah, we're talking past each other. Yeah, I hear you. Yep, that's right. Yeah, this is hard to see, but it would basically look like that. Yep, the bottom, bottom something right. like four year natural life or something like that. <laughs> I have a question. The 1.87, that's really just for the first year, right? Because our, our mill rate and everything could change. So it's it could be that that's just Theoretically, the first year it could go up or down every year after that based on what our mill rate is. Good question, but probably not. <laughs> well, good question. Okay. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, so the mill rate is projected based on what Dr. Rob mentioned with a projection in property values, a projection in state aid, and so on and so on. It is a projection. The dollar eighty-seven per thousand is the projected mill rate for the ten point three. So for, for those full ten point three. For those four years, if it's ongoing, like you said, for our natural lives, it's only, it's not it's not necessarily year five could be eighty-seven cents or four dollars and eighty-seven cents. Like we only are projected through four years. Right. So as the day, we'll just play this out. Um, you'll see in 23, 24, it's listed at four and a half. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be that the district would not take on 10.3 in year one, it would take on four and a half million. Year two would be 2.2 million. Over the course of the four years, the impact would be 187. Okay. And we're also keeping in mind that we're projecting out four years almost three biennials from now. Right, right, right. So it's really hard for us to kind of prognosticate what is the exact tax impact, but I do think to Scott's point, by stacking it, we're being even more transparent with our community about what is the, what we think, potential worst case in. I would just, if it's okay that I have, yeah. feel like I'm sitting in the either seat. <laughs> um, <laughs> you are. <laughs> uh, um, you may recall when we did the 38, $38.5 million referendum and we didn't borrow all $38.5 million on day one, right? Mm -hmm. We borrowed a sum and then when we were getting low, we borrowed the second sum. We never did borrow the third sum, right? The 5.5. But we didn't borrow it all up front because it seems silly to do that. The amount of interest we would pay would be obnoxious when we wouldn't need all those funds. But this is not the... Not the I, I use that as an example to just say it's not that we would go for 10.3 because at least from what you see on the screen, only four and a half. I'm gonna say only 
but four and a half million of the 10.3 would be needed in year one and year one only. So yeah. that it wouldn't be all right away, it would be over the four years. But this is not borrowed. No, I just use that as an example, right? Uh, that you don't tap into all the funds that you would need over the course of the term, that it, it, you take steps to get there. very confusing. As a person who's actually been through referendums before and knows a little bit about school finance, this is confusing to me. So I can't imagine how somebody's going to pick this up and really understand because I think Brad had a good point. To me it looks like it ends in 27. Um, I don't know what the impact is for year one to my pocketbook. You know, I'm just looking at, and it doesn't really say what that 187 for every 100,000 that that's actually the 2627 10.3 million. I, I find it very confusing. So the buck 87 though is what you can get. Like the, 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 the buck 87 that provides you 4.5 that provides you over the course of the four years the 10.3. So that is your, by year four, taxes will increase $187 compared to what you're paying now. Is that right? Okay. Maybe we just put in another column that can be a cumulative uh, bill rate impact. I think that makes sense. And then to Rod's point, 27, uh, 2027 and beyond, uh, it would be ongoing. Does that help to clarify or is it still too worried? We're trying to be as transparent and truthful as possible at the same time we don't want to overwhelm, right? This I, think, is. I think when we put it in like chart form, it's easier to kind of digest the chart and the paragraphs and the chart and the paragraphs. Well, the paragraph at the bottom looks like it applies to everything. So it looks like on day one, yeah, it's going to be 187 per one that one right. By putting in that new column, we would be really clear about that. So to Diana's point, to achieve that $4.5 million next year, citizens taxpayers will not go up by $187 per $100,000. Right? We would have another column and associated with the specific that's row. A very good idea. And then it would be cumulative or an aggregate as you go down and at the bottom line 27, 28 and beyond it would have the $1.87 in aggregate. But if you're suggesting to put a mail rate for every single year that's, that's there's no way. There's too many variables to project that out. It's important to hear. In our last referendum letter, I'm sorry, I could have pulled it up. Did we have an example of like if your house is $250,000, this is the impact? Did we do that? Mm -hmm. Something to consider. The point being though is, I think with that, had a definitive amount in whatever you borrow, you borrow. This is different because it escalates, so to speak, and so it's hard to, at what point you peg that amount. Well, what I think I heard Scott say is that if you're raising the, the limit from one to two, for discussions sake, Bob, uh, from one to two, um, part, part of that could very well be eaten up by 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 levying for different for different stuff, right? I mean, essentially. Um, yeah. So. Or have, having to levy for additional stuff. Yep. So if the revenue limit allows in future finance to levy an additional amount of money based on per pupil increases and all of that, right? That would all be for internal operations, right? Keeping the lights right. on. Right. Kind of um, this is asking the electorate to increase funding off the revenue limit, regardless of what currently is allowed right. to be able to do additional activities. But what I heard you say was that from one to two, some portion of that could get eaten up based on circumstances from biennium to biennium or from our year to, to the next, right? 
Um, good question. So actually, this would be above and beyond that. Any of that? Yes. Good. So the way it's worded now, if I were to get this in the mail and not know any of this, I would think it would be going up 187 for every 100,000 entry year. But that's not what we're saying. So, I don't, and I get, Scott, your point that we can't guess what it's going to be every year. We just know that based on the last year what it's going to be. But I don't know how we communicate that so people know. Because if, if I got this and I thought it was going up 187 every year, I'd be like, I don't know. But if I know that it's going to get up to that, then that's a bit different of a ramp up. So right, and I wonder if maybe we were to have an introductory clause to this sentence here to say um, at full implementation, uh, something to this effect of the of the referendum in 26-27, voters could expect to see. So that way, people know that it, uh, this is progressive in its in its approach. But that's confusing because if we can't predict what it's going to be in 23 24 how can we possibly predict that at the end it's going to be this much that's, I, that's so confusing to me there are some assumptions we had to bake into that you know one of the assumptions is that we look at um, equalized property value and growing at about 1.5 percent when we build our budget annually we typically look at one one and a half percent last year it was seven percent turn on CNBC today they're talking about housing bubbles and <laughs> you know so it, it's just you have to have some kind of basis for uh, why you're making the decisions you're making uh, some of that is uh, enrollment do we anticipate that uh, flat and slightly increasing or slightly decreasing enrollment so we've been pretty conservative in that. other kinds of things that help us arrive at a dollar 87 we've attempted to be pretty conservative in our figures so as not to over promise and So what if we, instead of putting a column, you know, a column that has a number for every year, what if we put year one, and then the anticipated probable, because that number is based on a bunch of assumptions for year four. I think that shows a clearer picture of what we're going from to, as opposed to what we have now, which looks like 187 from day one. for people who are looking at it. I, I, and I don't think it's clear at all right now. I mean, if it's taken all of us this long with experts in the room, I can't imagine somebody getting in this, this in the mail would understand it. Yeah, and then I guess my other question would be 4.5. So I'm really sorry to revisit this issue again, uh, Bob, but what what is our guarantee that we don't chew into the revenue limit that we've raised through this referendum? I mean, what 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 is the guarantee of the of of t property taxpayers in this community that you know for whatever whatever reason it could be that we we chew into that we chew into that. Uh, 1.87 per per thousand. So, just for any elaborations. Yeah. So that we yeah. So that just for some reason, you know, oh, oops, you know, we we got to raise, you know, we got to, yeah, we got this expense totally unanticipated. So four, four boilers. We need four boilers. Okay. So the the similar to the product. I know this is a bar, but we also knew that we weren't going to use the 30 and a half million to help balance our day-to-day, year-to-year operating budget because the electorate voted to oh, we're bound by the very specific. Okay, fair enough. Got it. Got it. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're bound by the by the expression of the voters. Essentially, if we need a new roof or boilers or whatever that doesn't fit within the budget, we got to go back. We got to go back. Okay. On top of whatever this is. All right, so... So we've got we've got to figure out what to call the referendum, right? And then we've got to 
somehow figure out what to do with this table so people don't think it's going to be done in four years. So I just pulled up a previous graph, and I know this is going to be hard to see, but if you kind of compare it to what you're seeing up on your screen now, um, on the far left hand side, it had what year? 23, 24, 24, 25, 25, 26, 26, 27, and then the final row was ongoing. Then the question, um, how much money will this referendum provide the district? 4.5. Then the words would be the same as what you see here: an additional 2.2 for a total of X, an additional X for a total of X. Um, and then now the last row, the ongoing, we do the math to get to 10.3. And then the third and final column on the right-hand side, it said, "How much will it cost me compared to what I'm paying now?" So X dollars for every $100,000 of property value. X dollars for every $100,000 worth of property value. Um, and those are assumptions that you're comfortable making or can plug in. That's how we would get to the far right hand column over here. Scott, talk to us about, I mean, that's... It's, it's just based on a lot of projections. Um, and if Brian Brewer, people from Air were sitting in front of us, they would say the same thing. I even used the example of the 38 and a half million. Boy, it was so concrete, right? Here's what the district's intending to do. Here's the dollar amount. Here is the mill, uh, one mill rate based on projected equalized values and so forth come to an amount. Operations, tell me what districts do across the state as they tackle operational referendums. And the thing that I hear, and Dr. Rob, you've been, you've been kind enough to share your experience. The wording of how to, to um, the point you made earlier, um, the, how we phrase things to educate people on what the district wants. Obviously, I'm saying, I'm saying the obvious, that's what everybody's thinking. We have to come to a way of doing that, but it's not easy to put on paper. Not to say we can't do it, other districts tackle with the exact same issue. Um, I'm appreciative that Dr. Robin School Perceptions is on our team because they're able to draw based on their experiences from other districts. So we, if we need to do some more crafting of how to word this, you know, we certainly can. And I would say, Steve, we met together as a group, Jessica, what, four uh, times? Five, five times, maybe, to get to this point. So if the board feels that we need to go back to the drawing board and do some more wordsmithing to get some more concrete um, ideas of how we should display this information, we should certainly do that. Well, because Rod made a really good point, you know, we have to make sure that this, and Diane, we have to make sure that this this wording is accurate for our community to understand. But it, it is it is challenging. And I'm certainly not an expert in the wordsmith, but I have a lot of good people that are working on the team. I'm happy to, to coordinate that kind of discussion. Uh, Diane, you've always had great insight as to how to word these things. Your experience has been obviously um, value here at the table. I welcome you being a part of those kinds of conversations. I want to know, just so that it doesn't get lost in this discussion, the reason why this is staggered is because the district didn't feel it was responsible for us to take, ask for $10.3 million in year one. Why? Why? Because we didn't have the expenditure, we didn't have the need to expend that kind of money since we have extra dollars already in our, and so we're trying to be um, respectful of the fact that um, we want to continue to be excellent stewards of the taxpayer dollars. We don't want to take something in that um, we had no intent of, of using uh, in year one. And so that's where this kind of conundrum comes in here a little bit. And I just don't want that get lost in all of this because I don't want people to think anything other than the fact that we're only asking for what we truly, truly need in each of these years, given the backing out of the asset dollars. Thanks for allowing me to say that. And maybe, Madam President, it would be okay um, for us to, to convene another meeting to this effect um, and then bring something back uh, May 2nd. Uh, I know that we'll have a new set of board members at the table at that time, but I feel like maybe um, uh, Scott and I can uh, schedule a visit with those individuals just to kind of tell them where we're at at this point. The, the hardest thing about previews is... Oh, just that there's some more questions I haven't asked mine yet. Um, so if I'm a taxpayer and I open this and I draw to the chart, um, do you ever reveal how much, the, I mean, this is public information, but the, the district's overall budget? Like when I'm looking at this letter and I see 4.5 million, my thought is, well, what's the ratio? Like, is that a lot or is it not much? Or, you know, it's not information if it's not tied to something else. Um, we 
typically haven't. And the reason is the numbers feel big no matter what they are. And oftentimes in the comments, what we'll see is you have enough money. You have, you know, it's, 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 it's because people will think about what does my household budget look like? What does your household budget look like? And there's a factor of, you know, how many zeros after that compared to what's in my household income. Um, so numbers that big, it's hard, I think, for the average survey taker to appreciate why 4.5 is appropriate, why you wouldn't be able to do that in your budget. Because I think if we said, you know, your total budget is whatever, X million dollars, I think it would have done before comments will say, well, if you already have that much money, then why can't you already do these things? So the feedback while we have an expert in the room to pass along? Um, the other thing that I would say, think about is that is exactly what I, what I just heard, and it's the hardest thing, because as responsible taxpayers, what you don't want to do is take on more tax money than what you need. When it steps up, it's really hard. It's much harder for the average survey taker to understand. And so I was telling, um, I was telling a story about Parkview, and they're doing a non-recurring referendum, sort of saying, you know, X dollars after whatever, I think they're doing five years or four years or three, whatever the case may be. Um, but it's a set dollar amount over a set period of years. So I know that if I'm living in Orberville, this is how much my taxes are going to go up each year. But they know that it's a set level. I think it's two and a half for two million for three years that they're going to test. Here, you don't necessarily need that 10.3 million, so you don't want to ask for what you don't need, but because it's stepping up, the tax impacts are going to be different every year, and that's where it draws confusion. So the more you ask for what you need, the more confusing it is. And that's that's the you know those those scales that I'm thinking about going back and forth. That's what's hard to convey. When it's a single number over a period of time, whether it's ongoing or over a period of years, that's a number. And I will say, I know it's going to go up by $120 per year for every $100,000 of property value. But then you as a district say, I don't know, get insert number of $5 million per year. Every year. So step ups are what you need, but step ups are harder to explain. that these numbers are projections, mm -hmm. which I think you covered up ahead that they're projections, but restate that these are projections, mm -hmm. and that we know by that 26-27 that the projected increase is expected to be 1.8, and that there will be increases in the previous years that will ramp, I mean, there's... Somewhere between zero and... Yeah, somewhere between zero and 187, yeah. it's going to go, it's going to go up. I think there's a way to word it, so it's easier and I don't have that I don't have those words right now I had them a minute ago but they floated out um, but I think there's a way to state that so that we don't necessarily have to provide or get I don't want to guess either like and I feel like where we say projected I feel like that should be underlined italicized and bolded because they are projections because people will say no you said 187 and it went to 188 I mean I think there's a way to get there too, and I don't have the answer, but I think Dr. Salerno was pretty close there with being stewards of taxpayer money. We don't need all $10.3 million this year, you know, and this is over time. So I, I think there's a right way to restate that paragraph that I think we could get there, which would provide some clarity. The other thing I don't know is when we say that twenty after 27, it's ongoing, are we, are we getting in 28-29? Are we getting 1.8? Are we getting 2.2? What are we asking for in 28-29? We just say ongoing. Like, ongoing what? How much? I don't... That's not clear to me either. Yeah, so what I had is I did leave the 10.3 there, so I put 20 a year and ongoing, and then 10.3 million. I don't know if that helps or not. So in 28-29, we would be asking for the whole 10 point. Three. You uh, you would have it if it's approved. You would not need to ask. And then in wherever we're at now, twenty nine thirty, we're asking for another ten point three. You would have it. You would not need to ask. It's it's and forever and ever unless you yeah. choose to levy otherwise. And I've never seen a district not levy recurring funds that they have access to. Point three plus ten point three to make twenty point six. It's just the original ten point three that's being asked for. But we're asking. So we're ramping up for the first four years, and then year five, six, seven, eight mm -hmm. is 10.3. Ten, a total of 10.3. Okay. I just want to make sure I... And I think, I think we need to make the case for the additional...
additional per year. Like you're, so you're saying that year one you need 4.5 million. Why year two, three, four do you need the extra? What's is that inflation? Like what is that? Yeah, and that's um. So actually, that was something that that these two gentlemen had in, and and I took out because that I found that confusing to try to figure out because I was doing the math of. If you're gonna, do you really need this much for inflation in 24, 25? You know, like when you try to assign a pot of money, and this is what we're gonna do with it per year. Um, I thought that might have pigeonholed you more than what you wanted to. So instead of saying we're gonna use, you know, X million for this in this year and X million for this in this year, um, I chose to put it up above the table to say over the course of the next whatever number of years, we're gonna use it for these purposes, which is. Paying the increase in cost of transportation, utilities, and so on. Yeah, so this is this is what they had sent to me, um, and that's what I moved up to the top. The other other reason is for your curious folks. You know, I don't know how many teachers we have on staff, uh, but it's easy to do 1.8 divided by your number of teachers, and then say every teacher is getting a raise about that amount. And that may not be true, but that's the way I read that table to say you're going to take $1.8 million and put it directly into salaries. Maybe you want it. And maybe that is the point of it.
$532. Just under $300 actually higher than AMPRO. Uh, but the district would be recommending this vendor because um, of the warranty work and also the loan closed service that they provide. Motion made by Jeff and seconded by Jessica to approve the Chromebooks. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 7C, consideration of bus purchases using 2022-2023 budgeted funds. So this is our first commitment to actually purchasing something using next, next year's budget. So you may recall at the board workshop, the board approved a budget for next year. And that budget was the purchase of one new school bus. And you may recall just recently we found a way to purchase um, two new school buses um, using a variety of savings and so forth over two fiscal years. And so this um, being recognized again in the 22-23 budget using budgeted dollars, the actual bus itself is identical to the two buses that um, the board approved here just a short time ago. And you may recall, and we addressed this again, at BGT a couple of months ago and most recently on finance last week that Thomas is the recommended uh, make uh, because for two reasons we've seen um, good reliability for our transportation team and also um, our mechanics are licensed to do the work too. And so Brian told that his team recommend that we purchase, consider purchasing this 2023 Thomas bus. Motion to approve. Motion made by Ron, seconded by Jeff to approve the new bus purchases. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion passes. Item 78, consideration of a new policy. Hey, 657 federal funds. So one thing I just want to say is thank you, Finance Committee members, because we've been reviewing three to four policies for a number of months. And this particular month, the month of April, we actually looked at three brand new policies. And you might say, wow, we have a lot of policies already. Why are we adding three more? Um, we receive federal dollars every year, federal grants, special education, and food service are the most notable items. And it, through the conversations with the VHB review of our policies, it seemed appropriate that we add three new federal grant federal funding policies. The good thing is it doesn't change what we currently practice in terms of day-to-day -day procedure and activities. Nevertheless, it, it spells things out. Two points I want to make. Number one, um, the word federal is capitalized and a lot of these policies we were going to make those adjustments. Um, and, then this, and then the second item is they're fairly long policies. And so uh, an item was brought up at finance last week, well, wouldn't we shrink this policy and make a lot of this an admin rank, which is a good point as well. I recommend it in this particular case because it's dealing with federal funds, which is a very, very um, important item. I really do think that all of these language items need to be part of an actual policy. And I will say that for all three policies, not just this one. This particular new policy called federal funds, um, it recognizes, I won't go through all the, the sections, but if you have questions, I'm certainly happy to answer them. But the policy recognizes the need um, to not only really acknowledge federal legislation, but that we follow the rules and requirements anytime we accept federal dollars. So this includes monitoring fiscal activities that we're taking on, um, both in expenditures and revenues, but then also making sure that we're both acknowledging and we're implementing accounting practices that we're required to follow. And that is all regulated through the Department of Public Instruction. So all the activities that we take on by accepting federal dollars, we report directly to BPI, who is sort of the interme intermediary between the districts and the federal government. And that's the purpose of this first policy called federal funds, policy number 657, the first of three brand new policies. And again, this is not new in terms of what we do, but it's documenting it. Um, motion to approve. 
this first reading. Jessica? Yes, Ron. Aye. Leah? Yes, Jim. 
Yes. Diana? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Then I have a yes policy 659. Mm -hmm. Alright, Scott, you're almost there. Item 7G, consider revision of policy East for the public gifts to schools. So this was also a topic of conversation at our finance committee last Monday. And as you know, many of you have served on finance over the years. And any time that we receive a donation of over $1,000, it gets presented to the Finance Committee for consideration. So it's a standing item that's on every single agenda. Um, and the revision to this policy doesn't change that $1,000 requirement to go to the Finance Committee. It just suggests, as, as Dr. Solano has shown at the bottom of the screen here, it suggests that for donations that are connected to larger projects, larger activities, if it exceeds $25,000, that there would be an advisory committee that's made up of one board member, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so rather than having it be um, a small amount, it would be $25,000. Finance committee felt that if something exceeded $25,000, it's significant enough that there needs to be more collaboration on the use of those funds and its recognition. Motion to approve. Second. Motion made by Rod, seconded by Jeff, to approve revisions to policy 840. Roll call vote, Jeff. Jeff. Roll call vote, Jeff. Yes. Diana. Yes. Jim. Yes. Leah. Yes. Rod. Aye. Jessica. Yes, and I am signed yes. Policy 840 is approved. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Thanks everybody, for bearing with me. I appreciate it. This is strong, though. H, consider 2023-2024 course revision music appreciation to America's music. Yes, thank you. So this is one of two music courses that are being provided to the board. This is a revision. Um, the current course is called Music Appreciation. And in working with John Lawrence, who provided this revision in the class and the music department, uh, the team would like to change the uh, music appreciation to America's music and bring in historical aspects of um, music throughout U.S. history. Uh, they will be working to embed the newer state music standards. Um, and then this revised course with them will be part of rotation <coughs> of the year with other non-performance music classes, which would include music theory and composition and music technology. Um, there aren't any major additional costs of course. It's still going to be now revised, but Mr. Russell will use some open source uh, resources as well as pull from his current collection of music. Motion to approve. Second. Motion made by Ron, seconded by Dana to approve America's music. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 I'll close, say nay. Motion passes. All right, we'll begin with the last set of those action items course removal. Item 7, I consider 2023-2024 course removal physical science. That's a structure. Yes, physical science. Uh, back in September of 2021, Dr. Shalom has a thank you, you're so good, had the presentation up. Uh, we had two members of our high school science team, Tom Shea and Phil Jakes, meet with us to talk about some changes in the science department, whether we were looking um, at licensure, looking at uh, uh, NGSS, how to have more you know, choice and inclusion in our classes. And at the end of that presentation, we came to the conclusion that uh, it would be best to remove physical science and phase that out. Uh, currently, in physical science is a class where we do have some key tracking. Uh, we have students who have uh, IEP or special education needs, um, and maybe who are students are more at risk, and we feel that we would like to make sure that they are part of the biology and chemistry or biology and physics sequence along with their pages. Um, we also have uh, had movements within our support services that we do have who were able to increase um, our, our special education staff. So we do have a special education teacher dedicated to our science department who can um, be spread less than and can be working with students within biology and chemistry classrooms as well. Uh, so the team uh, back in September and then we decided to bring it to the board during our typical course discussion in the spring to talk through all the removal of physical science. Motion to approve the removal of physical science. Second. Motion made by Leah and seconded by Jessica to approve the removal of physical science from the curriculum. Further discussion? So I would just like to say, as I said in September, I'm not a 
favor of moving physical science. I think it's a more approachable class for kids who don't think that they're good at science or maybe need a soft start to things like biology and chemistry, and I, I'm not in favor of removing that sort of course from our curriculum. I think science is important. I think getting kids into science, interested in science and loving science is very important, and I think that there are kids out there that would benefit from this course. Therefore, I'm not in favor of moving it. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye, aye. 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 Paul say nay. No. Nay. I think that was four. Yes. Motion does not pass. Uh, we will roll call vote that. The motion was made by Leah and second by Jessica to remove physical science. So now we'll take a roll call vote on removing physical science. Jessica? Yes. Rob? No. Leah? Yes. Jim? Yes. Diana? No. Jeff? No. And I am a no. Motion does not carry. Item 7J, consider 2023-2024 first removal of senior survival. Sarah. Yes, senior survival. Yeah, uh, members of our CT department have requested that senior survival uh, be removed from the course catalog. Uh, this course has been one of two classes that has fulfilled the uh, personal finance graduation requirement that we put in place for our current class, our current question class. So that's the class of 2025. Uh, the reason that this re request was made, I was for any reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, we are, are we have we have been looking for ways to address our current uh, student requests within the family consumer science coursework and, and departments. And with the Google Senior Survival, we are able to offer some of our other classes that are um, more popular and lead us to that and improve funding for certain fields. We also feel that the current uh, personal finance course fits better with the DPI personal financial literacy expectations and standards or the senior survival class um, did not align as well with those standards. Uh, the current teacher, uh, Samantha Schultz, would like to focus energies more on aligning her classes with ProStart and SafeServe certifications which align with the academic and career planning pieces. We also know that the staffing levels within the business and social studies department um, will be able in the future to absorb students within those departments to take the standard personal finance class that we currently have. Those are some of the Motion to approve. Second. Motion made by Leah and seconded by Rod to remove senior survival. Further discussion? Um, I have a senior who is taking senior survival and personal finance and probably should have taken both and said that they were basically the same, like he, he was the same class. So I feel pretty confident that removing it is probably fine. Don't know how he got into both classes, but he did. Any other further discussion? Right, all those in favor say aye. 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 agenda 
Board of Education. All those in favor say 